Welcome to Douglas Wilson's The Podcast. This audio is brought to you by Canon Press. The podcast episode 162. Thanks for joining me. Uh, good to have you here. I hope you're having a good commute or whatever it is you do when you're listening to these things. So I want to begin with episode 162 with something, uh, just some of, my, some of my reflections on a series of episodes that uh, we're in the middle of here in Moscow, and that you may have um, uh, gathered uh, something about it if, uh, from news or from Facebook or from Twitter or from something. We've had a uh, masking order for a while here in Moscow. When the COVID panic first swept the country, Idaho went into an emergency mode, and then the mayor put us in, a, in an emergency lockdown uh, order. And since I believe, uh, you know, in Leviticus 13 and other places, I believe that the civil magistrate does have a legitimate authority when it comes to quarantining and fighting off infectious diseases uh, or protecting the public, life and limb of the general public. And so when the tornado warning sounds, tornado siren sounds, I don't think the elders have to meet and determine independently whether there really is a tornado before they cancel the church service and send everybody down to the basement. So I, I believe that when it comes to infectious diseases, deadly infectious diseases, I believe that the civil government does have genuine authority. And I think that there's no problem with defaulting to their judgment on such things, which uh, we did. So at Christchurch, we went to online services, which we did for three weeks. It became apparent pretty early on that there was something fishy. And so we started to push back pretty early on, and we then conducted three drive-in services just outside the city limits, and we bought an FM radio transmitter, and all the cars uh, came and parked, and we broadcast the service uh, to the cars. And we did, uh, did that for three weeks, and then we went back to in-person worship. And when we went back to in-person worship, we did not require masks. I'm, I'm giving you a short history here. Then uh, early in the summer, we had decided on other grounds, completely independent of all, all of this, that we wanted to have at least a couple of uh, joint services with, uh, with our various, uh, we've got two services uptown, two services in the Logos gym and one service downtown. And uh, we determined that we were going to have one big joint service, which we did, I think it was in June. When we held that joint service, uh, there was, uh, that hit the newspaper. And right after that, uh, the mayor issued a masking order for Moscow, which was subsequently ratified by the city council, and it appeared to be a response to the fact that we were meeting in person. So we did that, and then we had another joint service uh, uh, later in the summer, and then we had a big uh, gathering with Grace Agenda, and all three of these things, the two joint services and Grace Agenda, they were not super spreader events. We didn't get any reports of anybody catching anything out of these services. Well, just a few weeks ago, the city council met again, and they extended the masking order into January of next year. And you have to understand that when they extended the masking order, there had been, in Latah County, zero hospitalizations and zero deaths. There still have been zero deaths. And after we began pressing this point, it was announced that uh, the hospital has had, uh, I think, a couple of COVID cases. But even that is ambiguous. Uh, were these people who went into the hospital because of COVID or were they people, you know, was it a lady who went to have a baby and she was tested also and was found to have had COVID? So we, we still have minimal hospitalizations, uh, if that, and, and no deaths. And yet we're living under an emergency order that the city has imposed on us without ever actually defining what an emergency is is what constitutes a health emergency. When did we enter this health emergency and why? And what are the metrics that would have to be met uh, for us to leave this health emergency? Well, nobody will answer this question. And because of that, when the city extended this masking order, we determined, our 
ministerial session determined to uh, have what we call a flash psalm sing. So we had a flash psalm sing a couple weeks ago. It was on a Wednesday, and we gathered at City Hall, and the idea was to sing three psalms and the doxology and then go home. So the whole thing would take about 15 minutes, uh, three psalms and then uh, doxology and then home. And when we got there, the police were there. They warned me that they would issue citations, and I passed that information on to everybody. And we began to sing, and, and the end result, I won't go through this blow by blow, but the end result was that three people were arrested, and they were arrested, well, it's hard to say, because on, the, on one of them, the most famous arrestee was uh, Gay Branch, and I understand that on his citation, it, was, it wasn't for failing to produce ID, he was cited for failing to maintain social distance and or uh, mask. So. He was arrested, and uh, another uh, young married couple in our congregation were arrested, and then two men in the group were given a citation, a misdemeanor uh, citation. That was Wednesday. Uh, by Wednesday night, the whole thing had started to blow up, as, as you can anticipate. It blew, to be, blew up because here are a bunch of Christians singing outside, and they're gathered for 15 minutes, and, they, the, <laughs> and it's shut down. People are cited. Uh, with misdemeanor citation, which could carry up to six months in jail or a thousand dollars, and there were some arrests that came out of this. Well, th- this blew up uh, Wednesday night and all day Thursday, and uh, the city of Moscow was left with all kinds of egg on their face. And then we had another follow-up psalm sing on that Friday, and it was uh, we had b- there were about three hundred people at the first one, and then we had about five hundred people, I would estimate, at the second one. And it was really inspiring how people turned out because there were parents, you know, lining up babysitters for their kids in case they got arrested. It was that sort of thing. So we gathered there with 500 people. This time, there was a small group of protesters. We had like 500. They had about 20, 25 protesters who were there with with instruments, drums and whatnot, to try to drown out our singing. And they, they made it necessary for us to sing uphill, but we still were able to sing. And and then went home, but this time no arrests. And then a week went by with um, nothing happening. And then just two days ago uh, from this recording, we had another psalm sing on Wednesday, had about 250 people gather in a different part of town, Friendship, Friendship Square. And we sang three songs, the doxology, and then we sang uh, one patriotic song, uh, America the Beautiful. We did that because I really wanted to uh, sing something that's found in the second verse there. Um, God, mend thine every flaw, confirm thy soul in self-control, thy liberty in law. And then while we were singing that this last Wednesday, there was a group of silent protesters across the street holding up signs. One protester standing in the middle of our circle holding up a sign saying that the psalm thing was an abomination. And then in a window, we were on Friendship Square, and there's a, an apartment house, a former hotel apartment house, on one side of Friendship Square, and somebody had a a speaker blasting a Cardi B song. Um, It's a top popular song right now, WAP. I won't repeat any of the lyrics here. If you look them up, be prepared. WAP by Cardi B. The lyrics are beyond gross. They are misogynistic. They are uh, vile. They're just just beyond vile. Now, the thing that's striking, and and blasting that kind of pornographic uh, music at a group where there are a bunch of minors is against the law. It's against the Idaho Code, Idaho Code 1815. So there was some one person with a boombox or a sound system up in the window blasting this porno song at all of us uh, while we were singing. We couldn't hear it while we were singing, but in between, it was a um, cacophonous racket. But the difference is, and this is, I'll just finish with this observation, uh, the person upstairs blasting us with this was breaking the law, and we were down in Friendship Square breaking the law. He was up there, one of him, breaking the law, and we were down below, 250 of us, breaking the law. Uh, So we're all breaking the law, but I want you to notice the crazy times we're living in. Uh, We were breaking the law because we were singing, asking God to bless America, and we were singing uh, about liberty and law. And this other person was breaking the law, because he was blasting beyond vile lyrics over a bunch of Christians 
trying to praise God. It's quite a spectacle. Now, one last thing. Why are we doing this? Well, the city government uh, has not and cannot define what they mean by emergency. So we're, we are not protesting a decision that happens to personally inconvenience us or a decision that we happen to personally uh, find distaste for. What we are protesting is arbitrary government. Arbitrary government is the kind of government that would say, uh, we require by law that if it's under 50 degrees, everybody in Moscow has to wear a sweater. Continuing with our podcast, episode 162, we come to our little hamartiology section. Hamartiology, as you know, is the study of sin, and by this, we were referring to studying in a good way, the way Wellington studied Napoleon. We come to the next word in our lexicon of sin, which is babelos, babelos. This word means profane. As we've seen many times in this study, sins are a herd animal. They travel in groups and they grow in clusters. And uh, the first use of that word, babelos, is found here, 1 Timothy 1.9. Knowing this, that the law is not made for a righteous man, but for the lawless and disobedient, for the ungodly and for sinners, for unholy and profane. There it is, for unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, dot, dot, dot. And then 1 Timothy 4.7. But refuse profane and old wives' fables and exercise thyself rather unto godliness. So think of this word as meaning sacrilegious or irreverent. Our English word comes from the Latin profanum, meaning outside the temple. So the temple is a sacred space, and that which is outside the temple is you know, the opposite of a sacred space. So profanum, outside the temple, is where our word profane comes from. That's where our English word comes from. First uh, Timothy 6.20 O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science falsely so called. And then again in 2 Timothy 2.16, it says, But shun profane and vain babblings, for they will increase unto more ungodliness. So in the pastorals, you notice that uh, everything I've quoted is from 1 and 2 Timothy. In the pastorals, the word is used generally, and then of fables, and then of babblings. So, generally, uh, profanation is bad, then fables are profane fables, and then babblings are profane babblings. The idea seems to be describing a reckless disregard of the truth of sacred things. When you're just chattering, you're disregarding the truthfulness, the veracity of sacred things. Or when you're telling uh, old wives' fables, same thing. There's one more use in Scripture, and that's in Hebrews 12:16 lest there be any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. So, Esau is a profane person who had contempt for the uh, legacy of his birthright. So, you can see the logic here. Esau did not value the spiritual worth of his birthright. He was contemptuous of it. He was irreverent toward it. He was a profane man, not meaning that he swore a lot, but that he held weighty things to be as nothing. For our book review this time, this time being episode 162, for our book review, uh, I want to um, talk a little bit about Thomas Boston's book, The Crook in the Lot. The Crook in the Lot. This is a book on affliction, basically, on, on trials and afflictions. And quite frankly, it's a subject that Puritan pastors, frankly, excelled on. Now, some people might say, well, you know, didn't, didn't the, these pastors go on and on and on about afflictions, and doesn't that indicate that they were sort of Eeyore, gloomy, melancholy types? Well, no, you have to keep in mind um, that, that we have it pretty good here in the 21st century when it comes to creature comforts, and pastors back in the day had to deal with people who were suffering a great deal of a great many ailments who died relatively young, and you, you constant, infant mortality was crazy. So when Puritans used to prepare their children for death, this is not because they were dragging morbidity into the nursery or dragging it into you know, troubling children's minds with these things, but it was because in those days, lots of children died. So it was routine to lose 
many of your children before they grow, grew to adulthood. Now, Thomas Boston, uh, so the Puritans, when it comes to this subject, the Puritans being uh, strong Calvinists and being pastorally wise and being really thoroughly educated in the scriptures and in classical literature, they really shine on, the, uh, on this subject. So there's uh, Jeremiah Burroughs, The Rare Jewel of Christian Contentment, which is fan- fantastic. Thomas Watson's All Things for Good, which is on affliction, which is also very good. And then this book, The Crook and the Lot. So Thomas Boston works through all sorts of basic practical scenarios where Christians are afflicted, where Christians, whether it's uh, regardless of what the crook is, you know, you've got this kink in your hose, you've got this problem, you've got this pebble in your shoe, or you've got this severe trial. Thomas Watson provides all kinds of basic, earthy, practical, sound, scriptural encouragement. And this sort of thing is not a Christian equivalent of Stoicism, where you're basically told to suck it up. Instead, it's resting in the wise providence of your holy father, who is indeed a father. Mm-hmm.